This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidoui Yuat. It's Monday, May 25th. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. The dark cloud of COVID-19 is hovering over the United States on Monday's Memorial Day, a day set aside to honor the hundreds of thousands of American servicemen and women who sacrificed their lives for their country. The U.S. death toll from coronavirus is by far the highest in the world and includes the more than 1,000 veterans who have died from the dreaded disease, according to the Department of Veterans Affairs. Overall, the U.S. has more than 1.6 million confirmed infections and nearly 100,000 deaths from COVID-19. In South America, Brazil added over 650 new coronavirus deaths to its reported toll, while its number of overall cases, the world's second most, tops 360,000. Brazil's number of infections prompted the United States to announce a travel ban for foreigners who have been in Brazil at some point in the prior 14 days. Now to Africa, where the World Health Organization says the continent has reached a major milestone with more than 100,000 confirmed cases. The virus has now spread to every country since the first case was confirmed in the continent 14 weeks ago, according to WHO. The United Nations Agency says there are now 3,100 confirmed deaths in Africa. In South Africa, President Cyril Ramaphosa has announced a further easing of the COVID-19 lockdown from June 1st, allowing most of the economy to return to full capacity. South Africa is reporting more than 22,000 infections and at least 429 deaths. And Zambian Information Minister Dora Silia says she has tested positive for coronavirus, but was asymptomatic and is now in self-isolation. Kenya is stepping up its efforts to find a local treatment for COVID-19. The Kenya Medical Research Institute, East Africa's leading medical research facility, is testing the efficacy of an herbal medicine known as Zedupex. Lene Rubaga has the details. The search for both a cure and a vaccine for the coronavirus has intensified around the globe, including in Kenya as medical researchers race to find the elusive remedy. Dr. Festus Stolo of Kenya's Medical Research Institute is taking the lead in finding out whether a herbal-based drug will be effective against COVID-19. Zedupex, developed in 2015 by Kenyan researchers, has been used in the treatment of herpes. Dr. Tolo says his team does not know yet whether the drug will work against the virus. We have started looking at the pre uh, clinical uh, efficacy of this product. We are still on very early stages. We cannot be able to really say. Knowing that uh, the herpes simplex virus is a DNA virus and the coronavirus is a RNA virus, uh, this really means that uh, we need to first of all confirm, check whether there is activity before we can be able to really say this is a product which we can explore further for COVID management. Rudy Eggers is with the World Health Organization. Eggers says that standardizing the various herbal cures could be quite a challenge. In, in other medicine, we find that there are very specific levels of the uh, active ingredient in it. And in herbal cures, frequently you find very varied um, uh, components and then also levels of those components in there. So in fact, you would have to standardize these cures to make sure that you know what is in them and what component is actually acting. So that's quite a, a step to, to be taken before you can really evaluate these cures. Dr. Kefa Bosire, who is at the University of Nairobi, also has reservations about traditional cures, saying that mass production could be an issue. The immediate challenge we would face is getting sufficient quantities of the plant so that we can prepare them to, to supply the number of patients that may require it on a short notice like we have experienced during this pandemic. 
and uh, so this would require uh, a lot of work to go into uh, identifying the best way to upscale the growing and uh, the collection of these materials. Despite these hurdles, researchers at Kemri are pressing ahead with their study of herbal treatments for COVID-19. Lenny Rovaga for VOA News, Nairobi. In East Africa, long-distance truckers delivering cargo are suspected of carrying the dreaded coronavirus. Kenya has started testing for COVID-19 among truckers traveling from the port of Mombasa to Tanzania and the landlocked countries of Uganda, Rwanda, and South Sudan. Amina Chombo reports from Mombasa, and Africa 54 managing editor Vincent McCory narrates. This is Mombasa Port, a shipping hub for East Africa. Here, cargo from overseas gets loaded up and sent to points throughout the region. Truck transport is slowed to a crawl in some places as countries close borders or restrict access while trying to protect residents from COVID-19 infection. Truck drivers have been viewed with suspicion after some tested positive at border checkpoints. Kenyan officials say neighboring countries haven't taken as many measures to contain the virus. We are brothers with Tanzania, but they have taken a different approach in fighting the virus. We have restricted our movements, most stay at home, we practice social distancing, we don't attend mass in holy places, but they are free to do all that. We can't allow them to infect us. As of last week, Kenya's health ministry had reported 33 COVID cases at the Namanga checkpoint bordering Tanzania. Uganda's ministry confirmed at least 139. So Kenya's interior ministry last week ordered that all truckers must be tested 48 hours before leaving from Mombasa or entering Kenya from elsewhere in East Africa. Those with a clean bill of health get a certificate allowing them to transport cargo across Kenya. They must be retested every 14 days. Kenya's Interior Secretary launched the testing at Lunga Lunga checkpoint on the border with Tanzania, urging truckers to heed precautions. The result is that testing has backed up trucks for several kilometers at some checkpoints along the Kenya-Tanzania border. It takes us three days to know test results. We need to be told early about the day's tests will be done. This will help us in knowing whether to carry perishable goods or not. But the restrictions aren't going away anytime soon. Last week, Kenya closed its borders with Tanzania and Somalia, except for cargo trucks whose drivers have been tested. Amina Chombo reporting for VOA, narrated by Vincent McCory. Worldwide, one of the first measures taken to contain the spread of COVID-19 was the closure of schools. Millions of students are being affected. In Kenya, e-learning platforms were introduced to address the challenges. For more insight, Africa 54's Pondiho spoke to Dr. Uteri Kanayo, co-founder of the Children in Freedom School based in Nakuru, Kenya. Dr. Susan Uteri Kanayo, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you for having me. You quit uh, your uh, job uh, in the UK to go back uh, to Kenya to do something meaningful and to give back to people. How have things uh, changed uh, during this uh, very, very difficult time of COVID? We, we, we knocked on the doors of, of people who could help or finance. And when it didn't come, we decided to just build it ourselves and have a platform where we can teach children not only the Kenyan syllabus, but true African histories. And that's what we've been doing. We are three years old. And it's a really powerful school with a lot of Afrocentrism driving through. Now, during this COVID um, season, um, we have gone straight into technology. Because of the lockdowns, the children must stay home. Initially, it was one week, two weeks. Then you, you slowly realize it's going to be a month, and you don't know for how long. And the government was also teaching through TV, radio. They've also gone the e-learning route, and they're encouraging schools to also follow that route. Because my husband is a software um, engineer, we were able to set up a school platform that hosts all the subjects so we were able to now transform what we were teaching face to face all the subjects all the classes into an online platform which will have your class you'll have your subjects there 
you just click on the day today i'm having maths on monday maths on monday will be ready so the teachers are coming in and they're looking at the syllabus these are the topics that i need to teach right now and they are recording and packaging it in a way the child will understand how many people are enrolled into that sub program our students are all enrolled we are 150 so they are all on board doing the program with us how long did it take you to set up an infrastructure like that um maybe two weeks what we did first is we piloted it in in april long before other schools so i think the international schools were already doing it and we were able to sort of benchmark by the time we were we were now opening for term two in may and early may we were it was just a matter of um just moving forward uh, how about uh, in uh, circumstances uh, or situations uh, where uh, the parents are not technologically savvy, uh, the kids mm -hmm. themselves are not technologically savvy, and mm -hmm. uh, you have issues of uh, the internet? There are a lot of people who are, are less yes. privileged, though, who don't have access uh, to internet. Internet is still expensive for most people. What do you yes. do? Um, that is a good question, and that has been a, re a reality for some families. Um, I think schools, schools like ours um, and others, need to offer an option. Schools should should encourage all sorts of um, uh, learning, depending on the circumstances of the family. What are lessons, if any, have you learned uh, during this uh, period? And uh, going forward, what is it that uh, you can do to leverage on the existing uh, technology that you already have uh, to make things better? Okay, if there's anything we've learned from COVID-19 is we must be prepared at all times. The one tool that helps you to be ready is technology. You, I cannot sing enough how technology helps to combat um, pandemics and, 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 and help to steer things, be it in pharmaceuticals, be it even in any leadership. Technology has been key. Even the president addresses all Kenyans through technology. The minister does like that. So number one, lesson learned, be ready for any disaster. Be ready for any trouble. Think, always think ahead. And that will cushion Kenyan children because it is our responsibilities as the educators, uh, the, 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 the parents, to be ready. What keeps you going? What motivates you? The passion that I have for African children. I, 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 I wish I could draw it or equate it or you could see my heart. I'm so angry that Africans are seen at the bottom. For what? What can you not do, Paul, that someone else is able to do? That anger that no one should ever bring an African down, no one should look down on us, and the fact that I know that to, to turn the tables around, we must start with the children. But children are developing, they are growing. There is hope. When you teach children well and when you empower them, there is hope for Kenya, there is hope for Africa. Asante sana. Okay, Paul. That was Africa 54's Paul Ndiho speaking with Dr. Uderi Kanayo, co-founder of the Children in Freedom School in Nakuru, Kenya. Asian markets are in mixed territory Monday as Tokyo's Nikkei index closed 1.7% higher as Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe lifted the coronavirus state of emergency on Tokyo, while the Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index is 0.15% lower as the financial hub was rocked by new reports of protests over China's proposed national security law, which critics say will bring an end to the city's semi-autonomous status. Shanghai's index closed slightly higher, while Sydney's S&P is up over 2%. Seoul's Kospi is up 1.2%, while Taiwan's index finished the trading day 0.05% higher. All three U.S. stock exchanges are closed in observance of Monday's Memorial Day holiday. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, coronavirus deals a blow to tourism but gives a fresh breath to the environment. We'll be right back after this break.
Welcome back to Africa 54. As much of Europe remains under a strict lockdown amid the coronavirus pandemic, one country has stood out in taking a very different approach. Sweden has refused to impose such strict new laws and its people have been allowed to work and travel. In the early days, it seemed as though Sweden may have gotten things right as the outbreak ripped through Italy, Spain and Britain. But as Henry Rijo reports, Infection rates are increasing rapidly and there have been close to 4,000 deaths, prompting growing nervousness in the country. It looks almost normal, a glimpse of the pre-pandemic world. Cafes, restaurants and nightclubs in Sweden have stayed open throughout the pandemic, along with primary schools and shops. Instead of strict new laws, the Swedish government has asked citizens to take individual responsibility for social distancing. People over 70 and anyone feeling ill is asked to stay home. The theory behind Sweden's approach, sustainability. And I think the Swedish strategy has proved to be sustainable. I mean, we get figures now that people are actually increasing their, their adherence to our advice, not decreasing. It is very difficult to stop having very strict measures. I mean, that's the signals we get from all of these countries. It's very difficult to, to stop a lockdown. So has it worked? Ultimately, the death toll in Sweden right now is the you know, highest per capita in Europe as of this week. Um, and the you know, experience of their neighbors hasn't been as severe. So I think if you look at Denmark, which has taken a very different approach, a, a very strong lockdown early, they really got out in front of their, um, their outbreak. They've been testing significantly more than Sweden. They've been able to re relieve uh, a lot of their social distancing quicker. Almost half of Sweden's deaths have occurred in elderly care homes. Outside Sweden's parliament, victims' relatives have made a memorial to loved ones who they say died without help. Why they didn't protect our the citizens by closing the borders, by um, uh, protecting the people against epidemics. Experts say it is too early to tell who has got it right. Oh, we're relying on some historical experience, some modeling, but to an extent, all countries are kind of experimenting with different methods of safely opening up. And I think we have to be very careful and try to learn from one another. The economic damage in Sweden could be less severe, but the human toll may far exceed neighboring countries. The debate over such trade-offs will likely intensify as the pandemic continues to take lives. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. There are now over 5.3 million reported cases of coronavirus globally and more than 335,000 deaths as a result of infection. The United States has the most reported infections. As VOA's Ken Parabal reports, the country is noting a somber milestone amid a push to reopen businesses and churches in a bid to return the economy and daily life to some sense of normalcy. While visitors pack some U.S. beaches amid limited easing of lockdown restrictions in most parts of the country, the head of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, Dr. Deborah Burks, warned it was still anything but a normal American Memorial Day holiday weekend. You don't know who's infected, and so we really want to be clear all the time that social distancing is absolutely critical. And if you can't social distance and you're outside, you must wear a mask. The number of U.S. coronavirus deaths approached 100,000. A benchmark the New York Times newspaper marked with a full front page dedicated to listing the names of many of the victims from each state to date. The milestone comes as President Trump presses states to allow religious centers to reopen. Today I'm identifying houses of worship, churches, synagogue, and mosques as essential places that provide essential services. It was a welcome move for Dan Carroll, pastor of Water of Life Community Church in Fontana, California, where Gavin Newsom is governor. Uh, we don't want to break the law. We're prepared to go ahead no matter what President Trump had said or Governor Newsom because we felt like we've been very patient, we've been very diligent, and we needed to open up and take care of our people. The governors need to do the right thing and allow these very important essential places of faith to open right now for this weekend 
If they don't do it, I will override the governors. But despite the directive, some congregations that have already attempted to conduct in-person services were exposed to those infected with the coronavirus, including a center in Northern California. Certainly worshiping outside, maintaining social distancing, and, you know, obviously not having physical contact with, inner, with each other. And that's, I know that's difficult. We all have made difficult behavioral changes, and that needs to continue to happen. As more parts of the country begin efforts to reopen restaurants and businesses in an attempt to regain economic losses as a result of the coronavirus lockdown, Dr. Burks says the United States is also preparing for a second wave of the virus later this year. We are preparing for that potential fall issue, both in PPE, which is protective devices, both in ventilators, stockpiles, and ensuring that we're really pushing on therapeutics and vaccine development so we can be ready if the virus does come back in a significant way. If the virus does come back, President Trump has publicly stated he does not plan to enact the same restrictions or shut down the U.S. economy again despite the risks of spreading the virus. Kane Fairbaugh, VOA News. Traveling abroad used to be relatively easy. Pick up a country, get your visa if needed, book an airline and hotel, and you're ready to go. But as countries slowly emerge from the coronavirus pandemic lockdowns, travel industry experts say leisure travel is going to be the slowest to return, and it's going to be a different experience, especially with various restrictions still in effect. VOA's Maria Madiello reports. The coronavirus pandemic has changed everything, including travel. As countries move to reopen for visitors again, industry experts say it's going to take time to get used to the new normal. Jan Jones is with the University of New Haven, Connecticut. I do think people want to travel, and they're watching very closely the destinations that they want to go back to. Um, and, and keeping an eye on exactly what's opening up and how it's opening up. Um, but I think it's going to be tough in terms of international travel in the beginning. According to the latest data from 2017, the top 10 destinations for Americans include Mexico, Canada, Britain, Dominican Republic, France, Italy, Germany, Spain, Jamaica, and China. But most of these countries have restrictions now, including not letting in tourists or requiring quarantines at arrival. Currently, in the case of the UK, we have a two weeks quarantine, which is um, uh, unfortunately. And that means that if you arrive, you have to spend 14 days in, in quarantine, which in our mind doesn't make any sense and has been perhaps successful at the beginning of the lockdown. But based on the experience and what we have seen in other countries, it seems that makes more sense to perform testing. Besides that, the U.S. State Department still has a health advisory urging Americans not to travel. That's also hurting travel agents, says Kibret Walde Aragai, owner of Fana Travel Agency. Our business is down like 98, 99%. Oh, I would say 100% for the past three months. There is just nothing. They're not calling. Those who are calling, wants a refund for their money for the ticket they bought a long time ago. Some people are afraid, and even if they resume traveling again, it will be a different experience, says Peter Serda of the International Air Transport Association. We're accustomed to seeing over 200,000 flights go into the air every day in such a safe, efficient manner with various levels of comfort. Uh, but that's going to be different, unfortunately, uh, at least for the near future. As air travel resumes, passengers will have to get used to measures such as temperature screenings, physical distancing, self-service options for check-ins, the use of face covering, and simplified cabin service, among others. Maria Magiello, VOA News. Italy's most popular tourist destination, Venice, is beginning its slow process to a return to normality. The city's beautiful canals and palazzos have not seen visitors over two months, so it faces enormous challenges when it comes to recovering economically. But the coronavirus lockdown appears to have had a positive effect on the environment. Here is VOA's Sabina Castelfranco. For more than two months, like the rest of Italy, Venice has been on lockdown. Unused gondolas line the banks of its empty canals. When the authorities recently started easing the closures, a nearly deserted St. Mark's Square belonged only to a handful of police officers 
and a few Venetian residents taking a walk. The chairs of its popular cafes, normally filled with tourists from all over the world, lifeless and stacked up outside. Shops like this one selling famed Murano glass and clothes stores are now reopening to the public. For weeks, the narrow alleys of the Lagoon City were empty except for the pigeons to enjoy. Occasionally, someone walked their dog or pushed their child in a stroller. Roberto, a photographer, has had no work at all recently. He owns a small boat he occasionally uses to transport people, but there has been no business. He says at least the lockdown has meant the city, long known for pollution, is cleaner now. The first thing I noticed was that my nose immediately cleared. I am allergic, and this area, Venice and all the nearby plains, are very polluted, and I was immediately able to breathe with both sides of my nose. Only the ferries continued to operate during the lockdown, but they too were empty. Venice's deserted railway station will initially see the arrival of only Italians. Closed restaurants and hotels will be reopening, but with new distancing rules. Venetians have long complained that hordes of tourists had driven them out of their own city, but the coronavirus pandemic appears to have also changed that. Venice has always been a museum city visited by millions of tourists every year, but now people are asking themselves, when will the tourists be back? Sabina Castelfranco for VOA News, Venice. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.